welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's community conversation with Sierra Club Maine and our guest speaker and author Trevor Cohen. My name is Marina Bach. I'm the communications and outreach manager here at Sierra Club Maine, and I will be facilitating our webinar today. Before we get started, I just want to go through some quick Zoom logistics. Live transcriptions have been enabled if you'd like closed captioning. We ask that you please keep your microphone on mute to help with any background noise. Um, this webinar is being recorded for folks who weren't able to join us, so you can feel free to be on or off video. And then lastly, we ask that you put any questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A discussion with Trevor. And then I'd also just like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous land that we're on here in Maine. So we are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. Uh, Sierra Club Maine is really honored to work with the Wabanaki as they share their stories, and we thank the Abbey Museum for their leadership in decolonization efforts and their work to create effective land acknowledgements. I would now like to introduce our guest speaker, Trevor Decker Cohen. He's a writer who's passionate about a better future for the planet and seeks to move beyond doom and gloom. He's worked as a content strategist, marketer, and has edited two books. Healthcare Without Corruption provides a nonprofit vision for the US healthcare system and Thermo Info Complexity establishes a new theory on the way evolution works. And uh, Trevor, I'm so excited to have you on. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'll now pass it over to you to get started. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and I will just share my screen right now. Um, and then yes, uh, I also appreciate the land acknowledgement as well. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the, the Nisanan tribe, which is in the area that we're in. And we actually contribute um, some of the proceeds from the book to a research project, um, an advocacy, advocacy project um, led by the Nisanan tribe in the California Rancheria um, to preserve uh, knowledge and, and their history, as well as advocate for um, re federal recognition, which was um, taken away in the turn of the century. Cool, just present now. So thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm truly honored and um, I've spoken with many different Sierra Club groups and it's every, every time I do, I'm like, just, I'm just blown away with um, how you are able to empower people to participate in creating a better future and advocating for the planet um, and providing that outlet to folks all across the country. It's it's really, really amazing to see because, um, you know, sometimes I feel like in the in the climate world, we're a little bit like the hopeless romantics of the activist world. We have the seas rising, the land is drying out. We have a firestorm in one season and then a polar vortex in the next. But instead of tuning it all out, instead of watching Netflix on the couch at the end of our busy days, we stare straight into the heart of this seemingly hopeless situation. Cool. Um, but, you know, we're determined to fix this mess. We believe that not only can we stop the destruction of our planet, but at the same time, in, this, in the process of working on this, build a better world than the one we live in now. And, you know, to people outside this movement, I've, I've gotten this a lot that, um, and somebody actually said to me that it seems like your idealism is a little like planting flowers in a hurricane. Um, but I, I really don't think that what we're doing is foolish at all. Um, I think our secret as climate and environmental activists is that we think differently. We know that we can't solve the climate crisis with the same thinking that caused it. And so we view the future through a different lens. 
I think the way that we conceptualize a crisis defines how we respond it, respond to it. And so I would like to ask this group a question to learn from your wisdom as activists and environmentalists and to under, better understand the way that you see the future. And so I would like to ask what types of thinking, you can go to the next slide, do you feel we need in order to break free from our fossil fueled economy and envision a truly sustainable society? So I'll just open it up for anyone who wants to share their thoughts on kind of the, the thinking changes that we need in order to, to envision this sustainable society we want to create. Well, I mean, I think what we do is we tend to focus on problems. And um, if all we focus is on is problems, that's what we're going to get is more problems. I mean, energetically speaking, that is, um, it's kind of a law of the universe, right? So what we have to do is shift to uh, focusing on solutions. Right on. Yeah, you're speaking my language. Um, you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of um, the, the problems we face are just incredibly overwhelming. But if, if, if that's where it stops, if that's where our, our thinking stops, um, then we'll never have a chance to actually right. build the future we want to live in. Um, and uh, rather than solely just kind of avoiding what we what we don't want. So yeah, you're, you're spot on with that. I think okay, I that, uh, that um, we have to think community instead of individual. And that's a really, really hard thing to change to. I think um, mm -hmm. some groups do think community. They think about their neighbors and more. Uh, and in the business world, uh, instead of thinking about stockholders, we should be thinking about stakeholders, which is community. Uh, and I've thought this for a really long time and uh, worry that too many people now are, are sitting completely alone and think, well, I can't personally do anything and don't think they have a community they can do it with. Uh, but of course, the Sierra Club is part of that community now. So uh, as you mentioned, so uh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that's like also spot on, like thinking about how do solutions benefit our communities and how can our communities be leaders um, rather than kind of passive actors in um, the larger economic system and solely as consumers um, and like citizens in a community in both the place we live as rather the as well as the larger community um, of our, you know, country, our state, our global society. Um, yeah, I think that's extremely important. Um, that's great. Um, I see a, a chat from Matt um, as well about cradle to grave, um, reuse, recycling, and not endless extraction. And so, yeah, that's like moving, I, I moving to cradle to cradle from cradle to grave and thinking about things as, as in cycles rather as linear one way, um, one way systems in which we extract, we extract something, we use it and discard it. But instead we're thinking about it in a, almost like a nature based way um, where we're thinking about how do we regenerate everything in our system? Yeah, that's really great. Any other thoughts? Well, sure. So we have to think uh, long term instead of short term. And unfortunately, our short term thinking often leads into, you know, problems and issues in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, we're definitely have this short term goal oriented focus um, of like the next quarter being the thing that matters most. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not always how people have, have thought of things. And uh, you can see that through like seven generation thinking and um, 
a lot of a lot of other more kind of long term multi generational um, approaches to problem solving. I think we need to be willing to make uh, investments for the long term, not just for short term returns and um, in, in that way changing the way we do business you know, we have to we have to get off fossil fuels for example and that's going to take investments in electric vehicles you know, heat pumps weather weatherization energy conservation and that, that has to be done at every level yeah yeah i mean come at all i mean a lot of it comes down to putting our our money where our mouth is and I think we're a little bit we're, we're in I feel like we're in a phase where we're starting to move in that direction like these a lot of renewables have become more viable um, and people are starting to talk about um, sustainability across society um, but we're still a little bit in that lip service phase where we haven't fully committed our resources uh, to transformation to a sustainable society. Any more thoughts? I th keep thinking um, my big interest is energy and my second big in interest is plastics, but um, the, I think you pointed out in your book, I almost finished your book. I haven't gotten the agriculture part done yet, but um, you pointed out that in a lot of countries in Africa, well, a lot of places in, that are away from everywhere in Africa and India, that they've jumped over the uh, carbon-based energy other than when they used to burn trees and stuff. Uh, to solar power to uh, provide energy. Uh, and this is also sort of community-based. The great, great thing about solar power is that it doesn't have to absolutely be part of the net. And I, I loved your story about community-based distributed solar energy, uh, which really got me thinking about the retirement community I'm living in here. Uh, that maybe we could do something like that here. But, you know, India is in the COP26 insisted that they couldn't possibly manage energy without more coal. But on the other hand, they have all these villages that they could, you know, go directly to solar power instead of needing coal. I've been to India once, my one exotic world trip, and the air was absolutely horrible everywhere because they were burning trash and they were burning coal. Uh, we have to really get people to be able to use renewables to jump over the coal and go immediately to renewables like solar. And India's got a lot of sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely important to think about like what, what is powering the growth and development of the future? Is it, yeah. is it fossil fuels? Is it renewables? How do we make that work? And how do we make it work in a way that um, benefits communities? Any other thoughts before we move on to the presentation? All right. Well, thank you all for your insights. Um, I, a lot of these are really spot on. There's obviously many different really important ways of thinking that can help us move towards a fully sustainable society. Um, I had spent the last five years um, interviewing hundreds of different practitioners in sustainability, including experts and leaders in renewable energy, the circular economy, transportation, city planning, regenerative farming, and I combine this, their wisdom into this book, Bright Green Future. Um, and the goal if, of the book is to provide a glimpse into what a fully sustainable society might actually look like and how we might go about building it. 
Um, and so I hope in this presentation to add to your um, obviously already robust repertoire of sustainable design thinking. Um, and there were these three types of thinking that kept coming up in my conversations with folks um, in interviewing pe them for the book. Um, and I found that these were essential to creating a holistic vision for a sustainable future. These types of thinking are um, number one systems thinking, which is all about finding the deeper patterns that are hiding in plain sight. And so looking beyond the surface level of, of how we see the world and um, looking at how multiple, um, how one action can affect multiple different things in a system um, rather than um, looking at one, one solution on its own as, as trying to do, have one outcome. Um, secondly is, is community thinking, which uh, uh, Bonnie and others brought up, um, which is all about embracing local people as beneficiaries of change. And then lastly, we have regeneration thinking, which is all about creating both systems and communities that grow stronger and healthier over time, that rather than with each year uh, degrade and become um, less, less strong, become more resilient and more robust and more able to um, adapt to crises and respond to crises as well as um, prosper from different opportunities that come, come about. And so if you could go to the next slide, please. So our first types of type of thinking is systems thinking. Um, in a nutshell, systems thinking is all about looking at things as being interconnected rather than disconnected, about looking at cycles rather than solely um, looking at uh, a linear trajectory of, of progression from point A to point B, but instead of see seeing the end of one, of one cycle beginning the, 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 the start of another cycle. It's about looking at things rather than in silos as emerging all at once. And it's, it's ultimately about looking at the whole rather than solely all of the parts within it. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to share a story from an experience I had um, that I like to call the parable of the techie and the farmer. And it highlights um, the difference between traditional reductionist thinking that looks at optimizing one thing, um, which is often the, the predominant way we, we go about um, creating solutions um, versus what, what does a systems thinking approach look like? And this, this experience, this conversation had, was with a, um, was when, back when I lived in San Francisco, um, I had this memorable conversation with a quote unquote tech genius. Um, and in this particular conversation, we were sitting on the grass next to the ferry building. Um, and he was an entrepreneur, a thought leader and a futurist. And some, somewhere in the conversation, we landed on climate change. And of course he had like a dozen solutions for how to fix climate change easily. Um, and one thing that came up was he, he really considered organic and regenerative farming or permaculture to be pointless. He argued that if we wanted to capture or sequester carbon in the ground, it would be much more effective to use giant carbon capture machines rather than grow plants. He said, for every acre of biodynamic farm or ecosystem restoration, we could capture double the carbon by putting a machine on the land instead. I mean, of, of course, he might have been right about we could capture more carbon with that, but you can probably also see how totally wrong he was. I, I tell this story because it lays bare how silly the predominant way of reductionist thinking looks when taken to the extreme. Because when we only focus on one metric, we become unable to see the larger system in which our actions operate. If we looked at that same argument using systems thinking, we would see that the only benefit of a carbon capture machine is carbon capture. However, a regenerative organic farm not only captures carbon, but grows nutritious food, improves biodiversity, hold water, holds water in times of drought, absorbs water to prevent flooding, 
And maybe even that farm provides a community gathering space for people to learn new skills, reconnect with nature and experience the system of food production that sustains us. So when, when looked at side by side, you, you see that the benefits in a whole systems sense um, of an organic farm far outweigh any of the benefits of a carbon capture machine, um, even if that machine can maybe technically capture more carbon. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So stepping back, when we, when we look at kind of um, the society we built on a whole, we start to see what the pattern of reductionist thinking looks like when replied, applied at a massive scale. Both our cities and farms are designed as monocultures to maximize one metric at a time. We'll maximize residential housing in one area, commercial businesses in another, industrial zones in still another. And we really do it at the expense of creating a vibrant neighborhood with all the benefits that come from mixing these elements in different ways. Um, and then meanwhile, in the, in the countryside, we maximize the cultivation of soy, corn, and wheat in a sterile growing environment at the expense of the soil and ecology. We sacrifice the benefits of interdependent systems for the sake of a handful of metrics. And if you go to the next slide, please. But when we instead design for the larger system rather than solely its parts, we end up solving multiple problems at once and creating something far better than we could have ever planned for. This is an example of a neighborhood in, uh, called Agrotopia in Gilbert, Arizona. And when the, the developers, um, residential property developers wanted to turn the Johnston family farm into a subdivision, the farm owners urged them to do something different. They ended up instead building a mixed use neighborhood around a 12 acre organic farm. They turned the old farmhouse into a restaurant and converted the tractor shed into a place for small businesses and craft makers. And then they built a residential community around it with an elementary school, multiple types of housing, and even a senior living facility to mix, mix together multiple ages and, uh, and incomes within one, one area. And they really combine these overlapping social benefits of both a mixed use neighborhood with the ecological and health benefits of a biodiverse organic farm. And residents can walk to the local restaurant and coffee shop and then access fresh organic produce on the farm. And it's, it was built really in, in the heart of kind of suburban sprawl. And the neighborhood ended up becoming a destination in the area uh, with people visiting the breweries and craft makers and couple, couples even getting married at the orchard on the farm. And so you have kind of all of these other benefits that, that sprouted out of um, really looking at how do we design a, a system in when we create a neighborhood rather than how do we like maximize one, one aspect of living. Um, and so you can go to the next slide, please. And so the second type of thinking is community thinking. Um, and that's all about looking at communities as the agents and beneficiaries of change. If you could go to the next slide, please. Because we're, we're in the middle of a great transition from an economy run on fossil fuels to renewables. But we don't have to replicate the same inequality in how wealth is generated from energy production. You know, in the traditional relationship, the vast majority of profits flowed to a handful of energy companies and utilities. But as we can, as we transition, we can also shift the benefit to the community. Um, in California is one, one example, um, half of the electricity comes from what's known as community choice energy providers. And what these providers do is they reinvest profits back into community projects and prefer, they give more preference to creating local jobs and re residents can actually advocate for the type of energy that they want. And many of these community choice energy providers have reached 100% renewable or are on track to reach 100% renewables by 2025 while actually offering electricity that's 10% cheaper than the utility. 
um, I actually went into meetings with the like executive board of my community choice energy provider. Um, and I, I, there's like a group there that I met that was advocating to expand, um, expand the amount of money that goes to community projects there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's so many different ways as, you know, as, uh, I believe Bonnie pointed out with, um, with renewables being more decentralized, um, we have the ability to create decentralized benefits from them through a, a variety of different models, whether it be community solar, um, uh, sol uh, solar and wind co-ops, um, or community choice providers, or um, a number of different ways, or even on like an ind individual level um, with, with how people can benefit from solar. Uh, we have this opportunity to really shift the benefit um, away from solely the profits flowing to fossil fuel companies and utilities and the big energy companies um, to to the community and having um, creating that that um, community community benefit in the change that we create. Uh, so, if you go to the next slide, please. Another big part of community thinking is really adapting solutions to local needs and visions. Um, this is an example of, adapt, of a project that is transitioning coal country away from dependence on coal as this one fossil fuel commodity um, powering uh, what the eco economy of West Virginia um, and transitioning to a renewable future. And this is an example of Coalfield Development, which is a, an organization in West Virginia that trains laid off coal, mi coal miners to transform surface mines into food forests um, and then generate jobs and train people um, in agriculture. And they've also created a number of different social enterprises. Um, there's, they've created a, a construction company that builds affordable housing and tr uh, trains people to be contractors. Um, they've created a, a like a, uh, a furniture making company. They've acquired a sustainable t-shirt company um, that makes t-shirts out of recycled, um, out of recycled plastic for major league baseball. Um, and then they have also created a solar company that installs solar panels as well. Um, and they actually had the biggest installation of solar panel on this one factory that they, they created um, where they tr trained people in, in a variety of different, different businesses to create a more diverse economy. Um, and it, one of the inspiring models too is that um, they not only do they look at the unique unique um, needs of people in the area um, to create a to create jobs um, for after the fallout of, of coal's decline, um, but they also draw on the strength the unique strengths um, in that area and really basing everything they do on Appalachian values of gumption, grit, and grace um, as part of as part of like as part of their philosophy, and they really see these Appalachian values as as crucial to building um, a sustainable future of you know people who've survived in the mountains for for generations um, through their own through their own determination and using how to figuring out how to reuse things, how to grow their own food, um, and learn all of these these skills that we're going to need if we're going to create a sustainable society. Um, and so not just not just looking at um, all of the, the problems that, that are in front of us, but also like what, what are the hidden strengths that exist um, in our communities and how can we also learn from, learn from, from those in, in, in the work we do? Um, if you could go to the next slide too. So this is another example um, on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Um, it's a, an organization called Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. Um, and they train youth in construction and farming um, and a variety of other different skills to address both a food shortage, uh, a, or sorry, a housing shortage, a food crisis and unemployment that gets as close to 70% at some times. Um, 
And what they're doing is they're combining both community and systems thinking at the same time. They're looking at um, not just trying to solve one problem. I, w one quote I from somebody I talked to there um, is a lot of the traditional aid approaches was just to see like, okay, people are lacking food or people are lacking access to one, one item. And so um, we just need to provide that one item. And his, his quote was, um, we, we don't want to hand out propane and pampers anymore. Um, we know that people need that, but at the same time, it's not systems change. It's, it's not um, allowing people to create the, a, a better future for themselves. Um, and so they created this um, this initiative, this like multi um, multi element initiative that addresses both housing, um, uh, lack of lack of employment, um, as well as helps heal from multi generational trauma from uh, colonization um, and the the history that happened in in that region, and providing. Both uh, they created a community center that provides education in um, in the Lakota language and and food and traditional foods um, and provides a, a place for ceremony as well. And the entire place is also um, powered by solar. Um, all of the housing um, and all of the uh, the farm as well. Um, and it they've also from this too provided a, a a kind of an example of a platform um, where 70 other uh, indigenous communities reached out to them saying like, how can we do this um, in, in our reservation? Like, how do we, how do we take this kind of same learning um, from what you've done and apply that there? Um, and so they actually created a separate organization that's focused on uh, national indigenous empowerment uh, called the NDN Collective um, that was started by the, the founder of uh, Thunder Valley CDC. So you can go to the next slide. And so the third type of thinking is regenerative thinking. And regeneration can be thought in many different ways. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it can be thought about regenerating land. Um, so we're all familiar with regenerative, many of us are likely familiar with regenerative farming. Um, which is all about healing soils uh, and, and making the land stronger over time with every harvest rather than degrading it. So this is an example of the Regenerative Ag Alliance, which is an organization based in Minnesota um, that has developed this um, farming system, a permaculture system that uses a combination of, of chickens and trees to of fruit and nut trees to recharge the soil battery, as, as their founder, Reggie Hazlett Marroquin puts it, um, where the combination of, of chicken manure and leaf litter um, adds to the soil. So every year it gets stronger and stronger um, so that every harvest you have, um, it, it becomes more, more bountiful and more plentiful rather than um, slowly degrading. And what he does is he, he actually trains um, migrant farm workers uh, and farm laborers um, and their families to start their own businesses um, using this, this uh, permaculture model um, and using a combination of, of chickens and fruit trees and nuts um, can actually be uh, quite, quite lucrative for people starting these businesses. Um, next slide, please. And we can also think about regeneration from a material standpoint too. Um, and thinking about how does how sh how does the cycle of our what does the cycle of our materials look like? This is Ronin Eight, which is a, a comp this particular example, a company that regenerates e waste and lithium ion batteries to supply the next generation of electronics. Um, I think in kind of our, our modern high tech society, we 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 focus a lot on like how do we develop the next gadget, like how do we create the next big thing, we're not really thinking about what happens when something becomes obsolete. Where do all those, the, all those um, gadgets and computers end up? And often they end up in somebody else's backyard if, if we don't have a way to process it. 
Um, and a lot of it ends up in India, uh, Bangladesh, and Africa, where people, um, the kind of the toxic materials end up in these neighborhoods where people are processing them under very, um, very hazardous conditions. And so what this um, particular technology developed by Ronin 8 does um, is it, it, it actually uses a really interesting process of sound energy. They, they grind up all the materials in our e-waste and they've repurposed this old piece of mining equipment that used to be used to separate um, tailings in, in or separate materials from mine tailings. And they've used that um, to, to use the frequencies from this kind of massive tuning fork to separate the fiberglass and all the different types of metals into their own their own categories and from it have actually kind of extracted like a a periodics tables worth of different elements from our electronics and down to things you know the the major things such as copper tin silver lead gold and palladium to things like the rare earth metals which currently take a ton of energy and are very destructive to mine um, and they, they've been able just, just using sound energy, um, to think about how, like, how do we look at our economy as cycles of gold, as cycles of copper, as cycles of, of steel and tin and fiberglass, rather than solely as, um, cycles of, of trends and gadgets that end up being discarded. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. And so regeneration also comes down to regenerating people and regenerating communities and cultures. Um, and ultimately the society we, uh, we wanna live in is, is one where we all feel the confidence to be our best selves and have the skills in order to make that happen. Um, this is an example of Soul Fire Farm in Albany, New York um, that trains black and indigenous farmers um, in permaculture um, in construction, in a, in a variety of different um, skills to regenerate, to regenerate the land and then also go back to their own communities and start their own programs um, to uh, provide opportunities for people, for, for youth to get involved in, in farming and, and have a connection with nature um, and then see how, how they might also be part of, part of this, this great project of regenerating our, our society and creating really the, the world we want to live in. Um, and yeah, that is, if you go to the next slide. So all of these, all of these examples are stories that are in the book. Um, and I would love to offer you all 50% off the book if, if you are interested in it uh, with plum, promo code uh, Sierra. Um, and yeah, before I, I open it up to Q and A's also wanted to, um, say, if you want to get in touch, you can reach me at Trevor at brightgreenfuture.com. Um, I'm always happy to, uh, discuss any collaboration ideas or just to chat. If you have a comment about the book or just like any idea you have about sustainability, I love, I love connecting with folks. Um, and, um, I mean, it's, you know, it's sadly, it's, it's quite likely that um, the current reconciliation bill won't be enough to really prevent warming over 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means that there's, we still have a ton of work to do uh, in order to make up that difference. And I, I really believe that it's important to start articulating what our vision for the future really looks like so that we can make sure that our the desires and the needs of our communities um, are empowered in the the world we end up creating. And um, I wrote I wrote this book really with the goal to show real world examples of how we might make the sustainable society of our dreams a reality. So thank you all for listening to my presentation, and uh, we'll open it up to questions. I don't know if Marena, if if you had any specific questions or if you wanted to open up to group questions. Yeah, so uh, Trevor, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And just like your book, educational and inspiring too. Um, 
I think we all have some ideas, or at least I do, of what I can do in my own community to try to take some action here. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is um, your book talked about so many different uh, efforts from ordinary people around the world, what they're doing, the actions they're taking. Is there one in particular that um, either you have taken in your life that you would recommend we can work on today or just something that um, we can try to implement in our own communities to get started? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think I think the the I, I did I shared this example, the one that really blew me away when I, I got to visit um, Thunder Valley in uh, South Dakota. That I think really clicked for me in terms of seeing like really the process they that they went through to create that. Like they started by basically just interviewing people in their community about what they wanted. And, you know, it was really hard. Like it took like hundreds of community meetings um, in order to figure out like, what, what do we create? Like, what, what is the society uh, that we want to create look like? And then how do we go about building it? Um, and like, they started first with just like a small project to really build their confidence, um, which was really just building like a, a, a house out of sustainable materials. It was like a ceremony house. Um, and then from there, they started to uh, get more interest and confidence and say like, hey, we could actually do this and actually do something. Um, and then uh, built like kind of an office space out of portable buildings um, and then started building houses one by one um, and then built built that, uh, that chicken program um, that they have where they give fresh eggs to people, uh, who need them. And, um, anyway, that, that's obviously an example of like a lot of work and it was kind of like the ideal. Um, but in terms of like, what, what's like actually like the, the, I guess a, a more of a, a smaller entry level thing. And I, I would say, you know, I would, everyone in this room is probably already doing it. Um, you've already gotten involved with, with Sierra Club um, or, or other organizations that are working on like articulating what a better future might look like. Um, I think one, one thing that, that I ended up doing was getting involved in an organization that ref, kind of reflected um, kind of the values of, of the community that I had been living in um, and helped people um, create or start to envision what the future they wanted to look like in their community um, might look like. And um, so I, I did, I do have a, um, a follow-up activity, brainstorming activity um, to this um, to kind of get the creative juices flowing to, to sketch out a design for your own um, sustainable initiative um, kind of putting these different practices, um, and combining them with like a brainstorming of the new needs and strengths in your community. Um, and so that's, that's something that I, I did for myself. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, many different ways to get involved, but, um, yeah, it was a roundabout way of saying like, find find what vision speaks to you and then find um, people who are already working on that and then be, join in community with with people um, to do the the hard work of actually making it a reality um. thank you trevor um that's awesome and i i have that last slide if, if you want me to put that up too about the uh project or maybe yeah after, after the q a or sure. Yeah, I can send uh, send it all to you. If you go to brightgreenfuture.com slash envision, um, you can access this. Perfect. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Marina. Um, she's asking about um, your thoughts about the impact of agriculture. Oh, Marina, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So it's, so I have a question about animal agric agriculture. Because in Brazil, where the country where I'm from, um, you have we have the Amazon rainforest that's being completely devastated, and and the majority of the reason for the forest to be destroyed is to is both for pastures for cattle, because because of the high demand for beef throughout the world, and and to grow crops that to be fed to the animals. 
So what do you think about the whole situation with animal agriculture? Yeah, yeah, that is animal agriculture is is one of the, as you pointed out, one of the biggest contributors to climate change. Um, and, you know, I mean, the third to one half of all land on earth is used to um, either grow food for for uh, livestock or be pasture land. And so I I personally feel that like in, in my own life, um, we need to be eating a lot less meat. Um, I, I eat, I don't eat very much meat. I eat, I'm not, I'm not a vegetarian, um, but I eat maybe meat once every two weeks to once every week. Um, and so, yeah, I think we do need to, be eating a lot less meat. I, I, I don't, I don't know if, if we could get to a situation where everyone's going to be vegetarian and eating no meat. Um, but I think that, uh, we should be considering meat as, um, as like a delicacy and as something that, um, is, you know, in, in the past, you know, people didn't eat meat for every meal. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really, something that um, was, was seen as, as ubiquitous. Um, and so really thinking, I think it is really important to consider um, what, like what, what meat is doing to the planet as well as uh, the welfare of animals. Um, and that when, if we do have animal agriculture, um, we, we're not really, we're not, we, we're trying not to stress the planet uh, too much by just the sheer quantity of, of animals needed to provide meat for every single meal. Um, and then the, the ag animal agriculture we do have thinking about how it can be integrated into a, a farm system um, that adds to the, the fertility of, of the soil um, and adds to the, the nutrients um, and thinking about it from a nutrient cycle perspective. Um, so I guess like reduce, but then reduce and integrate um, into farm systems. Yeah, because I think that the problem here is that a lot of people are just thinking that I think it's the subsidies. That's what makes meat so much cheaper. But the farmers are not gonna, but a lot of farmers are not gonna be willing to end the subsidy. And they just have the obsession that with protein. So that's also something that's contributing. Yeah, yeah. I mean. You're absolutely right. Like we, through subsidies, we create the incentives in, in the, the market and the economy um, to make it both affordable for consumers as well as um, viable for the producers. Yeah, because at, at first I was really skeptical about, uh, skeptical about veganism, but then, but they went, once they did the research and then I saw that, that it's a sustainable diet I made the I made the switch. So, so I just think I just that at least that's my belief that people, we should be going in like that direction. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions for Trevor? Feel free to put them in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself since we're a small group and go ahead and ask. If nobody else has something, uh, something that worries me a lot is how um, the carbon industry, petroleum and whatever have discovered that uh, we're using less petroleum for energy, for um, transportation and stuff. And that, that will be the future. And so they're putting up more plastics factories to produce more and more plastics. Um, I was very fascinated in your uh, book about the people who had figured out a way to create plastics um, using CO2 that reduced CO2 plus, I think it was that one or so on, and um, actually made plastics uh, have they or have you done any thoughts about how to convert the plastics industry, the big, enormous plastics industry, 
uh, from petroleum based car uh, to systems like theirs, which they claim can end up being um, compostable or um, whatever, you know more about it than I do. Uh, I'm really worried about all these enormous plastics factories, particularly down in the south and where it is, Mississippi or something. But anyway, can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that's definitely something I've seen around, um, like plastics providing a, uh, I guess, a second life for the fossil fuel industry after we, we stop using fossil fuels to generate energy. Um, the example that uh, Bonnie highlighted from the book um, is of a company called Mango Materials, um, which is using methane capture from um, landfills and waste treatment plants. Um, and they are, they have basically, they feed it to this bacteria that from the, the methane, it naturally produces this compound, which is a, uh, I guess they call it a biopolymer, which is, it's been in nature for 200 million years. So it, nature has developed ways to break it down, unlike plastic, which has only been around for not even 100 years. Um, and so it, the type of polymer or plastic that they can create from this process um, is much more biodegradable than even like our, what we think of as our, our current um, biodegradable plastic that, you, that you'd get um, that's currently on the market. Um, and it, it also is, is more rigid too, so it can uh, serve a, vi a variety of different purposes, including like uh, casings for televisions and uh, computers, as well as like can be a thin film for plastic bottles and is, uh, can be composted in like a, a home compost system, doesn't necessarily need a uh, industrial scale system and also can biodegrade in the ocean. Um, so that, that, that is the like tech, on the technology side, like, these kind of things exist on on the like scaling side of like how do you know how do you compete with a giant um, industry plastics industry that has already set up billions of dollars worth of the factories? Um, I think that's that's a whole different beast. Um, and how you do it? I mean, the methane is there. Like we have. Uh, over two, probably 2,000 landfills and wastewater treatment plants that could be, uh, could capture um, methane and, and, you know, prevent it from going in the atmosphere, as well as, as turn it into this uh, bioplastic. So kind of doing two, two solutions at once. Um, so the methane is there. Some of the technology is there. It really does come down to like, we need to put our resources into developing this more. Um, like this company is, is only one of maybe two that's working on this and they have maybe a few million dollars worth of funding. Like we need to think about like, how are we incentivizing things in the market? Um, and how are we, uh, you know, allowing these people who are outliers initially, um, which have these great ideas to uh, and become into the mainstream. So it requires more resources. That's obviously a whole whole other thing about how do you how do you make that happen. But um, I think it, I think the first step is realizing like how what we could actually do and how awesome the variety of different um, solutions uh, are available to our us available to us are um and then going through the hard part of thinking about like okay what are the policies that would enable it what are the resources that would have to shift um, to make it happen but it's it's hard <laughs> to have an yeah. easy answer to that thank you any other questions for trevor All right, Trevor, do you have any um, closing words or anything you'd like to add before I do a couple of closing slides? Um, yeah, just, I mean, just really a big thank you to you all. Um, 
really appreciate your your contributions uh, both to this conversation as well as um to sierra club and, and through your own activism um yeah again like feel free to reach out if, if you ever want to get in touch at uh my address is trevor at brightgreenfuture.com um and yeah and also i mentioned that um sustainable design activity follow-up i've also if if people are interested we'd be happy to lead a like facilitate a workshop on on doing that um particular activity um if that's something anyone is interested in um and yeah uh, thank you all and i'll just turn it over to you awesome thank you trevor um and i'm going to be sending a follow-up email mm -hmm. to you all and i'll link to trevor's website and also that activity um, of envisioning a sustainable society. I'll link to that so you all have those resources. Um, and before we go, I just want to share a couple of closing slides with you all. I uh, just want to thank you so much for joining us and a special thank you to Trevor uh, for taking the time today to talk with us and share all of these awesome actions that are building a better future for all of us, really. Um, so it was great to have you, Trevor. Thank you. And we invite everyone to stay updated on our work here at Sierra Club Maine. You can follow us on social media and also subscribe to our newsletter on our website, sierraclub.org slash Maine. And then before we go, I do just want to invite everyone to our next community conversation, which is December 7th at noon. The topic is mining. So acid mining is really a serious threat to water quality in an area specifically in Maine that not only provides clean water to Cobscook Bay, but is also a potential source of water to the Passamaquoddy Reservation located in what we call today as Pleasant Point. So I hope you'll all join us for that. Um, I'll send a link in the uh, follow-up email to register for that as well. And that's it for our presentation today. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Trevor. And I'm sure we'll uh, talk more soon. Thank you so much for organizing this, Marina. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.